Okay, we're recording, good. Um, so I'll be chairing this session. Uh, as usual, if you have questions, please raise your hand in the Zoom and I will tell you to unmute. Uh, so our first speaker this session is Dorita Haronov from Hebrew University, and she will be telling us about a computational lens on quantum experiments. So please take it away. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks for the organizers for in the invitation. I wish I could have been in Kyoto uh, and join you there. Um, so the talk I'm going to give today is about um, uh, what I view as, as a, a revolution in, um, in the area of quantum computation and its effect on physics. Uh, and it's, it's going to be half uh, a survey talk, and half of it is uh, going to be devoted to a recent work with uh, a joint work with Jordan Kotler and Shailang Shi. So, um, wait, how do I move this? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, can you see, can you see um, the full screen now? Can you see the, the full page? Yeah, okay. So, um, over the past, uh, I don't know how many years, uh, uh, we've, we've been seeing, we've been witnessing um, basically a sequence of revolutions um, coming from quantum computation, uh, following the first, of course, the, the basic quantum revolution um, 100 years ago. So the first revolution was, of course, the invention of quantum computation. Uh, but about 10 years later um, came another revolution, which, uh, which um, I would say it sort of shifted a little bit the focus of quantum computation uh, and quantum algorithms, which was mainly uh, in, motiv motivated by computer scientists. It shifted the motivation to what can we learn from the information um, perspective on, uh, on quantum uh, systems, um, what can we learn from that about physics? Um, and that gave rise to the birth of, uh, of essentially a new field, quantum Hamiltonian complexity. And it told us a lot about, about ground states and about uh, uh, essentially uh, um, a map connecting uh, very different types of physical systems by looking at them through the co the, their computational power. And that really gave a different point of view on, on condensed matter physics. Um, both of those revolutions were really studied very thoroughly um, in theoretical computer science. Um, and I want to I want to claim that over the past decade, we have been witnessing another revolution, which is the quantum algorithmic experiments revolution, in which uh, quantum algorithmic techniques have been introduced into experiments and have actually completely changed the way we think about experiments. However, this uh, revolution has not been um, really studied from the theoretical point, theoretical computer science point of view. And I think there's a lot of room uh, to study that both from the theoretical computer science point of view and from the physics point of view. And basically we've only sort of uh, touched uh, the tip of the, we've only seen the tip of the iceberg in, in the capabilities of experiments in which algorithmic techniques are introduced. Um, quantum computation techniques are introduced. So, okay, maybe maybe I should uh, um, I should skip ahead to just um, okay. Um, I'm debating what is the the background whether I should talk about the about the the first two revolution for a few minutes. What do you say, Andrew? Maybe I should set the language. That sounds um, sounds good. Okay, so so. Um, just to, to set the, the language, um, the first two revolutions, why do I call them revolutions? Well, obviously, um, obviously they changed a, a lot of, of how we view quantum systems, but, um, but uh, I want to I look at it from, from a particular point of view. And this is the point of view of, of, uh, of universality. So uh, quantum computation basically um, uh, told us that what was the pillar of uh, computer science uh, called the extended church Turing thesis, which says that all physically reasonable com computational models can be simulated by a Turing machine, meaning that the Turing machine captures the notion of computation, of efficient computation. Well, that notion has been completely undermined by uh, quantum computation. And, and so 
if we look at the set of problems that can be solved in polynomial time by quantum computers versus that set that can be solved in, in polynomial time by classical computers, well, these two sets are different. And that says that, um, that, that quantum systems cannot be, are not uh, polynomially equivalent to, to classical systems from their information processing point of view. And so quantum systems are believed to violate very violate the extended church Turing thesis that says that basically all these computational models that we, we can think of that are realizable are equivalent. Quantum is, is out of this um, uh, map. And so basically what we, we learned from that is that we should think of, of, um, of the model of quantum computation as, uh, as telling us something about, about this, uh, this point, what can we, what can, how can we think of, of, uh, of information processing in the world? Um, it tells us that uh, basically we should, we should change the, uh, the extended church Turing thesis to a version which we call the quantum church Turing thesis, which says that basically the quantum computer um, expressed here by BQP for the set of problems that can be solved in polynomial time by a quantum computer, um, it defines in some sense um, all polynomial time processes in the world. Um, they're all equivalent, whether you, to, you look at adiabatic evolution or at quantum walks or at many other models um, that you can think of, um, quantum field theories, um, they're all polynomially equivalent. And that sort of sets some, that sort of puts some kind of equivalence, equivalences uh, between very different models, uh, quantum, quantum models or quantum physical systems. Okay, so with that background, this is, this is what we've learned from the first two revolutions. Um, Okay, and with that down, background, I want to tell you what what I view as the as this third revolution of quantum experiments. Um, okay, so so let's try to start with a very simple experiment: uh, X-ray diff diffraction. So we have here a crystal and photons uh, scattered off the crystal, and there is a camera and computer that uh, perform some uh, uh, processing of of the photons, the the locations where the photons hit. Um, the detectors and uh, and and from that we can deduce uh, deduce the structure of the crystal. Now, over the past uh, I would say twenty years already, we have seen um, more and more computational ingredients entering this very um, simple type, not so simple, but uh, but basic types of of, uh, of experiments. Uh, such as this uh, X-ray diffraction. So I want to give you some examples. Um, by the way, please stop me and ask questions if I'm, I don't know, if I'm using, if, if you object. Um, so uh, so the, first ex the first example I want to give is, is the example of sensing and metrology, uh, where ingredients like entanglement and quantum error correction have entered the picture and have shown that we can do things which are uh, much more efficient if we if we use these notions, so for example, if we use uh, if if there is some phase affecting a photon and we want to measure it with with uh, with high precision, um, uh, Giovannetti, Lloyd, and Macone told us that we can actually use noon states, um, where here we have n photons in one path and zero photons in another, superimposed with uh, zero in the first path and n n photons in the other going into a BIMP splitter in a way which leads us to achieve the Heisenberg limit instead of the standard quantum limit um, in terms of the precision as a function of time. Um, an interesting idea comes from uh, not from a, an idea related to entanglement also, quantum error correction, where um, in sensing where you want to um, measure the, the um, frequency of uh, uh, in some system with higher resolution, you can achieve again the Heisenberg limit instead of the standard quantum lim limit in certain cases um, by applying some very rudimentary version of quantum error correction and basically prolonging the signal before it decays. Um, okay, so this is first example. Second example is uh, something well known to the participants of this workshop. Um, 
um, Black Holes as Mirrors, the famous paper by Hayden Preskill, um, which, in which they basically suggested um, an experiment um, involving a black hole. That's, of course, a Gedanken experiment. But this experiment involves in some, um, in some stage at the end, some kind of a very complicated quantum computation, which applies some decoding to reveal the entanglement between two systems. I won't go into the details, but the point is to actually understand if uh, if the the black hole uh, um, is if the evolution is unitary, if uh, if information can be retrieved, and um, and uh, and that uses essentially it's a it's a Gedanken experiment, but it uses a full fledged quantum computer to perform. So it's already thinking of an experiment as if we have a quantum computer at our disposal. Um, another example is the example, did I miss an example? No. Um, another example is, is that of, uh, of quantum, of adding interactions and adaptivity to experiments. Um, so this is a set of examples that, uh, that uh, was motivated by a theoretical computer scientist uh, attempting to test and verify whether the quantum systems are actually behaving the way they should if we're trying to, to program them to, to be a quantum computer. Um, and since we cannot simulate, we cannot predict their behavior because that would take exponentially long, we need some other way to verify that they, they behave correctly. And that is also kind of an experiment. And it turned out that in order to perform it, you can do this by a very uh, sophisticated interaction between the quantum system and, and the verifier. I think uh, Tomoyuki talked about this earlier, right? About this particular type of, uh, of experiments. Um, um, okay, so, so that's another type of experiments and notice that it uses interaction and adaptivity, um, which the adaptivity is, is uh, both interaction and adaptivity is used to some extent in, in current experiments, but uh, this type of interaction between the physical system and the experimentalist is, is very structured. And it, it, if you go deeply into the, the structure, it uses, um, um, it uses combinatorial structures, which are, uh, which are uh, new and they come from computer science and they allow testing physical systems in ways which were not possible before. Um, okay, and then another another type of uh, of um, of experiment uh, where actually we can use we can use uh, quantum computing ingredients to to do new things is this example of uh, it's with a paper it's in a paper of uh, of uh, myself and and my student Atia um, Yossi Atia um, and in this example you. Um, basically, Yossi noticed that uh, one can view Shor's algorithm as um, as a way to um, to find to to measure um, the energy of uh, of an eigenstate of a certain Hamiltonian with exponential precision in polynomial time. Meaning, you can actually violate the time energy uncertainty principle um, exponentially, and that uses quantum computers. And how how do you do that? Well, just uh, let me let me devote um, uh, two minutes to this because uh, it might um, you, uh, it might shed some light on how you can use quantum computers for for measurements. Um, so, if you recall, Shor's algorithm um, tells you that you you can factor a number n uh, by finding the order y of a certain the order r of a certain y which is co prime to n, um, and you want to find this r the least uh, integer such that y to the r equals one modulo n in polynomial time. Polynomial in n, in little n, the number of bits that you need in order to present the state, the, the input. And and Shor's, Shor's algorithm basically uses uh, a unitary that's written here that takes an x written in binary, just an integer, and multiplies it by y modulo n. And it turns out that uh, essentially by phase estimation, one can actually um, estimate the, the eigenvalues of this U to within exponential precision. That's the essential part of Shor's algorithm. And the, the point is that this can be done because miraculously, this is a very special U which can be taken to an exponential power in polynomial time. 
So it can be fast forwarded. One can actually define a Hamiltonian from this U. This is U plus U dagger. There's a missing dagger here. Um, and so this Hamiltonian can be fast forwarded, simulated on a quantum computer um, in time which is, which is logarithmic, polylogarithmic in, in T. So this operator can be simulated on a quantum computer in time which is polylogarithmic in T. This is what I mean by fast forwarded. And this is what enables one to actually apply an energy measurement um, of, of an eigenstate of this H uh, to within exponential precision. Um, so uh, if you want just a little bit more detail about it, that this is your eigenstate and you um, it's tensor product with the state zero plus one and then conditioned on this qubit being one, you actually apply this e to the iht. And then uh, because psi is an eigenstate, you get a, a qubit, which is in this state, zero plus e to the i e t one over squared of t. And that qubit uh, has information about, uh, about e, the eigenvalue. But if t is large, it can give you information about further bits of e. Um, and you can make t to be as large as you want, meaning exponentially large. So, so this is how it works. And, and we know that this is possible for any Hamiltonian which can be fast forwarded. So any Hamiltonian which can be fast forwarded by a quantum computer can actually, it's if and only if you can actually measure um, uh, the energy of, of, uh, of, of, of this, of a given eigenstate to within um, exponential, uh, exponentially, exponential precision in polynomial time and derive exponential violations of the time energy and such a principle. So, okay, so let me stop for a moment here and, um, and uh, maybe uh, get to the, to the main question of this talk. Um, I mean, I've, I've given you several examples, all involving quantum computing techniques. Um, they seem to be uh, experiments which are not of the common type, um, of course, not all of them have been actually implemented in the lab, but some of them were implemented in the lab. Um, and that brings us to the question, what is a physical experiment? How do we model a physical experiment in the most general way? We want to model the most general quantum experiment in order to actually understand the capabilities of general quantum experiments. And um, more to put it more precisely, we actually want to ask um, not just about what can be done by a quantum experiment, but to be more precise, we want to ask what can be done with a quantum experiment within some given resource amount of resources. So we basically need a computational complexity model of an experiment. I, I will call it a measurement, but I mean an experiment, a general experiment. So this is what we are after. We want, and, and now I'm getting to, to the work of, uh, of, uh, with, with Jordan Kotler and with Shailin Xi, uh, where we, we actually provide such a model, a general model for, for, um, for quantum experiments, which we believe is universal in the same way that, that a quantum computer is universal. The, in the same way that, uh, that I, I showed in the, in the very few minutes, the very first minutes of the talk uh, in this, in this slide, let me just jump to this slide, end slide. Uh, in this slide where I talked about universality of, of and connections between all different computational models and all of them are capable of the same quantum computing power. In the same way, and they're all equivalent to a quantum computer, yeah, to a quantum algorithm model. In the same way, um, we want to define a model which is which is universal for quantum experiments, meaning that if we study a, com a complexity of a certain experimental task with respect to our model and we get some answer, then any other in any other model of experiment, you will be able to, you will not be able to do it much faster. Okay, this is what we want. We want a model and a way to assign a computational complexity to um, uh, 
want to assign a computational complexity to uh, to um, the question of 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 achieving a certain experimental task. So let's let's have a first attempt, and I would actually like to to. Uh, to hear the audience opinion of what would be a good model for, for such a, a, a general model for quantum experiment. If anyone wants to, to be, uh, to, to suggest. Uh, a quantum circuit. So a quantum circuit is a, uh, is is a good starting point, but it has to interact with the physical system. Mm -hmm. So if I have here a quantum, if I have here a quantum circuit, then I need I need somehow a way to to get input from. Excuse me, I I, I have to uh, answer my son. Give me just a second. Sure, no problem. <laughs> אני, אני לא יודעת אם זה נאווה, אבל היא חייבת להפסיק, אם זה, אלא אם כן נפצעת או משהו, אני צריכה להפסיק. טוב? אז שתתקשר. אוקיי, אני מצטערת. Okay, so um, so this is so so a quantum circuit will not be be good enough uh, because we we need some model of interaction with the physical system. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is how do we interact with a physical system and and what is it that we want to even compute we, that we want to achieve with a physical experiment? So the first thing that maybe maybe comes to mind is that, um, what's a physical experiment? It's some kind of interaction between a quantum, a quantum system that that describes the, the the physical system in the lab, and the actual physical system that we want to perform the experiment on. Maybe it's something, some physical system here, and maybe this is my, our lab, and there is some kind of interaction between them. And the idea is that um, let's erase this. Um, you want something that that uh, takes this physical system here and outputs a classical number, maybe a bit string. And so how, how would this interaction work? Well, maybe it's like a black box interaction. Maybe, maybe it's like, maybe this is described by some super operator and you apply it some time and then you apply a quantum circuit and then you apply it again, etc. something like a, something like an, uh, a black box algorithm that has access to our physical system. It turns out that this is not enough. This is not enough. And I've, I've sort of alluded to why it's not enough uh, in what I said. Um, there are basically two ingredients which we need to put together. One is uh, this black box nature in which we don't have access. We have access to the physical system through some kind of a black box. We don't have control over the physical system. And the other is the interaction, interactive nature of the experiment. And so we, we defined a model which sort of is a hybrid between the two. And to, to come up with this model, let me start with, let me go back to our uh, example of the x-ray diffraction and see what are the important ingredients there. So there is this crystal sample, there is the, the photons and the camera. And notice that, okay, so, so the, the experiment the experimentalist's goal is to compute a certain function, okay? It looks at the physical system and it outputs maybe the, the structure. Um, the first thing we notice is that we don't have full access to the input for this function, meaning to the physical system. We only have access to the locations of the photons. So there is some hidden degrees of freedom here and that's very important. And the other ingredient is that uh, there's quantum interaction with those photons that we need to somehow model. So how to do that? Well, here is how we chose to do that. And we believe it's a universal way. So first of all, um, instead of just two Hilbert spaces, the Hilbert space of the physical system and the Hilbert space of, of the, the working space in the lab, we actually have three Hilbert spaces. One is 
the working space in the lab, say the, the, in, the, in the X-ray diffraction model, it's the camera and the computer, et cetera. There's the crystal sample, which we view as the hidden part of the system, the hidden degrees of freedom. And then there is the photons, which we, we denote by L, the lab. And this lab is what enables the interaction between the workspace, W, and the crystal, which is hidden. So we have kind of an interaction between W and N mediated by this L. Okay, so what's, what is our model? Um, we call it quantum algorithmic measurement or QAMS. Um, and by the way, do you see the picture when I, do you see the, the people when I move it? You don't see the people, you just see my slides, right? Okay. Um, so these are quantum algorithmic measurements, QAMS, and the model is this. Um, I have here the three ingredients and nature, that's the hidden set, the hidden degrees of freedom, L, that's the lab, and W, the workspace, and time goes upwards. And the input quantum system is described by two ingredients. One is the input state, and the other is a super operator that we can apply at our will, but it is unknown, it's, 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 it's viewed as a black box. And in between these applications of this black box, we have quantum circuits. In the most general way, we just apply quantum circuits um, between those calls to, the, to the, this lab oracle. Uh, we call this uh, the super operator of the physical system a lab oracle together with, with the initial state. I'll define it in a moment more, a little bit more precisely, but notice that we are, we allow here not only um, not only um, the input, which is the black box epsilon, the, the super operator and the input state, but also classical inputs that somehow describe, for example, the temperature in the system or or some classical input that just tells us which experiment exactly we want to to apply. And the output here is the output of the experiment, and we. We have here a pretty simple model, which is a hybrid of quantum interactive protocols between W and N, if you're familiar with interaction, interactive protocols from computer science, and a black box model in which we call this black box uh, super operator um, whenever we want to query it. And, and so this is our model. And to be slightly more precise, the model has three ingredients in it. The, the framework of QAMS has three ingredients in it. The first ingredient is the lab oracle. So the lab oracle is a pair of the input state rho n oops, and epsilon nl, that's the super operator. Um, and this is our input physical system. This is what we want to study. We don't want to actually learn it completely. We don't want to have a full description of it, of course. We never want. We want some kind of a function. We want to compute some kind of a function. For example, we want to be able to, to deduce whether a certain, uh, a certain system, um, uh, for example, in super resolution, we want to, to, com to estimate the, a certain frequency. Uh, to within some precision. So the output will be the frequency. But of course, it's not a full description of the system. Now, okay, so that's our input. Now, what is it that we want to do? We want that the experimentalist is, is sort of thinking of, the, of a certain problem. For example, estimating the frequency of some given system, uh, some given Hamiltonian. Um, this is described by what we call a task. So what's a task? It's a function that uh, takes lab, a lab oracle, maybe coming from a set of lab oracles. I don't know, may it can be infinitely many or it can be just two. And it also takes this input, the classical input here, um, maybe n bits, and it outputs some classical output, maybe on m bits. That's the function that we want to compute. 
And the task is to compute this function, but also the, the experimentalist is given the task to compute this function of the physical system, the input physical system with certain constraints. I mean, you can't just implement in the lab any experiment that you want. For example, we don't have a full-fledged quantum computer at the point at the moment. So the task is also specifying what are what is the possible set of operations that we are allowed to do. So other than the function, we're also given the the restrictions on the set of gates. For example, maybe they're restricted to be to work in 2D or maybe they are some of some part of the system is classical, etc. Okay, so this is the task. Um, and the QAM is basically the way to implement the task. The QAM is a specification of a quantum circuit, like the one, like the one drawn here, where in these quantum circuits, one actually specifies which gates are we apply. Um, so, and we, the goal is that this QAM will actually uh, indeed compute the function that the task specifies for any given lab oracle and for any given input string. Okay, so that's that's the model of QAMs. It basically defines what kind of quantum physical systems they are, uh, what are experimental tasks, and what are our protocols to achieve those experimental tasks. Other questions about this? Um, is is the task always a function or can it be like sampling from a probability distribution? Since I guess from right. the quantum so, circuit, you usually get samples from some distribution. Right, so, so definitely, in fact, I, I didn't want to get into this, but this is a very important detail. Um, instead of, of, uh, of, um, of this output, which is just a string, the more natural thing to do is actually to output the probability distribution. For example, if we think of the task of tomography, um, where, where the input states are, are coming from, some from a continuum, um, defining a function in this way would actually be impossible to achieve unless we have infinite precision, uh, because uh, if, we, if we sort of divide the, the we, we set an epsilon net on the set of states and we want the function to be some function, some function assigned to each, each uh, ball in this epsilon net, well, there will be always two, two states which are arbitrarily close to one to another, but have different values of the function. So since we don't expect to have ex infinite precision, um, this this is not reasonable so one can go around that by basically making sure that the function is outputting a probability distribution um over the possibilities so okay so so really you're right andrew that this is this should be probability distribution um okay so that's a qualm and um and maybe um, maybe if we look at some examples, it might become clearer. I think um, I think maybe the example of the X-ray diffraction was was pretty clear. It's just uh, uh, this is the crystal, these are the photons, and this is the camera. And the interaction between uh, the photons and the the camera and the computer is just classical. There's no quantum circuit here. Um, and then this quantum circuit, which is basically a classical circuit, also involves post-processing of all the locations of all the photons. Um, the other example that I talked about, about a measurement using a quantum error correcting code, well, uh, if you have here the probe, um, basically this L would be adding these two qubits in which, uh, in which uh, we have this quantum error correcting code. Um, the, they they are the ancillas and and uh, and um, um, yeah maybe I shouldn't go into the details of this uh, because maybe I didn't actually go through the details of explaining this example but um, but the point is that one can actually go through I think any experiment that you have in mind and we believe we have in the paper uh, eight I think I'm not sure but we went through and any experiment that we could think of fit into this framework. In the verification framework, for example, um, what 
if, if you're interacting with a quantum computer, this lab will actually have a, a description, a classical description. This lab register will actually have a classical description for the quantum computer, which gates to, to apply. And, and, uh, and the interaction is going to be by those classical descriptions plus some quantum qubits that uh, interact with a quantum computer. If you remember the, the protocol from Tomoyuki's talk. All these details are not very important here. Uh, I basically wanted, wanted you to get uh, an idea of what qualms are. Okay, so, so now we can ask, so now we have a model and it basically opens uh, a huge number of open questions. Um, wh what kind of experiments can we perform? Um, so far, it was bottom up building up those experiments, but we've learned from quantum algorithms that sometimes it's actually useful to have a general model to understand what is possible and what is not possible. And before we do that, we have to actually define what's, quant what's com the complexity, what's computational complexity in this model. And, uh, and the computational complexity here is naturally defined as the number of gates in the quantum circuits plus the number of applications of these super operators. And so this is really capturing the, the, the real physical uh, amount of resources that we are, we are using. It's, it's actually talking about the physical um, complexity, the cost, the physical cost of, a, of implementing this experiment. Okay, so, um, so you wanna study qualms from a computational complexity point of view. And we want to understand how much do the new computational ingredients in quantum measurements help us. Okay, so there are, there are various possible quantum ingre interesting ingredients that one can think of. For example, entanglement and coherence. Um, do we need to perform sequential experiments or is it sufficient to perform everything in parallel? How much does adaptivity help us? Um, how important is the number of queries? Um, how, how important are, is it that the quantum states that the, the uh, system is operating on will be highly complex or highly entangled? And so on and so forth. So you, you can really ask many, many questions now about computation complexity of, of, of quantum algorithmic experiments. Okay, so, so we focused uh, in our paper with uh, Kotler and, uh, and she about, uh, in, in this, we focused on this, uh, on this basic problem, which we thought is, is sort of essential to understand as a first step. And this is how important is coherent access? What do I mean by coherent? So if we look at this, uh, at this model again of, do you see my mouse here? Yes. Yeah, okay. Can see it, so if yeah. you look at this, at this uh, model again, well, um, coherence means two things. What we mean by coherence is two things. One is that the interaction between W and L, uh, the workspace and the, the systems that, for example, the photons, um, whether this interaction is coherent or is it classical? The interaction between L and N, we cannot control. This is given to us. We don't, we don't say it's in, we don't, cannot force it to be incoherent. But we can say that the experiment is not using coherence between the workspace and the, 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 the physical system that it's trying to, to study. That's coherence in space. And there's also coherence in time, which is we, we can ask whether the physical system, uh, the, the experiment, actually co uh, uses coherence between different applications of the same lab oracle. May, does it need to remember a quantum state between different applications? Or can it basically um, restart from scratch or, or prepare a different application, uh, a different state, but it doesn't use the different applications coherently over time? So is there an advantage for coherence versus incoherence? Um, access. And, um, and surprisingly, it turns out that uh, what we've learned from this work is that um, incoherent experiments, which are basically, as far as I understand, the most, most uh, the vast majority of experiments, um, 
they are they can be in certain case, certain situations exponentially uh, more costly in terms of their quantum complexity than if you use coherence. So coherent coherence um, in time and in space buys you exponential amount of resources or saves you exponential amount of resources. And I should say a beautiful work by Huang Kuang and, uh, and Preskill um, recently studied the same question of coherence versus incoherence in a slightly different setting, but very similar in quantum machine learning. And they also find this exponential uh, separation. They are not interested in quantum complexity. So their, their separation is, is only in query complexity, um, but it's also, um, it's also talking about this coherence versus incoherence um, uh, distinction. And it's a very beautiful paper. So, so let me, uh, towards the end of my talk, I want to actually um, describe the, the task that, uh, that we are, that we have found the, the physical problems that for which we have found exp these exponential separations. So, um, so I want to define these two problems. Um, the first is what we call the fixed unitary problem. We have a lab, uh, we ha we're given one of two lab oracles. Um, basically, we want to distinguish between two physical setups. One is a physical setup in which we have a random unitary, but it's fixed forever. Whenever we, we apply it, it's the same unitary. The other one is a physical system in which every time we apply it, it picks a new unitary. And this is our toy model for uh, the problem of distinguishing between, say, uh, Floquet systems and random unitaries or distinguishing between time de in dependent and time independent Hamiltonians. So this is what we call the fixed unitary problem. We want, the problem is we're given access to one of these two lab oracles and we want to find out which one it is. The other task is closely related to that. Instead of picking a random unitary and fixing it forever, we pick a, one of three ensembles, either a random unitary or a random orthogonal matrix or a random symplectic matrix. And we want to distinguish between the three. And this is also a toy model for physically distinguishing time reversible, reversal symmetries of these three different types. Um, okay, so I lost that. Hmm. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so in order to show you that uh, there is an advantage for coherence versus incoherence, I need to show two things. One is that how to do this when you have coherence efficiently. And the other is why this cannot be done when when our system is not allowed to use coherence. So why incoherent qualms are so much worse for these tasks? So I, I, what we have here is a picture of, of the experiment that, uh, that uh, works for the second task, for the symmetry distinction task. And um, it basically is a sophisticated application of swap tests. Not very sophisticated, just slightly sophisticated. It's not direct, just not the usual swap test, but slightly more sophisticated. Um, it's natural that that uh, that swap test will be useful here, right? For for example, for the first problem of the fixed unitary, distinguishing between the fixed unitary and the freshly chosen unitary, random unitary, um, it's very natural to use swap test because. Well, if the unitaries are fixed, if a given unitary is fixed, then of course it generates the same state for the same input. So you can just, uh, by a swap test, dis decide whether uh, the two states after uh, two applications of the oracle of the lab oracle are the same or not. Um, and and slightly more sophistication is needed in order to actually use swap tests to to distinguish between different symmetries. This is not 
it's interesting that you can implement those experiments uh, theoretically and maybe also possibly experimentally, um, but theoret but but technically the difficult part is not that the difficult is of course to give a lower bound um, that the incoherent qualms cannot be cannot achieve this um, this task in in any in any um, um, uh, it will take them exponential time. Um, I won't define exactly incoherent qualms. Um, they use LOCC between, the, the definition uses LOCCs, um, local operations, classical communication, uh, between W and L, that's, descri that's describing the lack of coherence between W and L. And the incoherence in time is described by complete, applying complete measurements between the uh, two applications of the lab oracle. But intuitively, I think, I think the incoherence is pretty clear. Um, I don't think I will go into any detail of the proof for lack of time. And I really want to hear what, the, the, I want to leave time for discussion. But, um, but the proof that uh, incoherent qualms take exponentially long to solve these problems um, is, is pretty complicated. It uses several steps. The main ingredient is uh, Weingarten functions. And the Weingarten functions are used because basically integrals like that, like this, appear in the, in the um, uh, calculation of what is the probability to get a certain set of, of outcomes, where these, uh, these this u is the unitary that we, are, that we want to distinguish, whether it's fixed or not. And these a's and b's correspond to different preparations of states, but they can be adaptive. They can be, they can depend on previous measurement results. And this dependence actually makes the calculation much, much more complicated and the, the whole argument becomes uh, very interesting and fun. Sorry. Um, uh, uh, for an argument, but uh, I won't go into that. Um, okay, so, so what we have seen here is that efficient coherent qualms uh, exist for those problems. And incoherent qualms need, need exponentially many queries. Uh, the proof is hard here. And so this, is, this provides a provable exponential advantage for coherent over incoherence. Um, so, okay. So one can ask, by the way, for those of you who are familiar with, uh, with uh, uh, various um, uh, result, a very famous results from uh, from quantum computation. Um, one can ask whether uh, we haven't, we shouldn't have guessed that this uh, this kind of coherence versus incoherence exponential advantage exists by, for example, the famous Simon's algorithm. Well, that's that's the answer is no because Simon's algorithm, if you look at it closely, it's actually incoherent. It lives in the in incoherent world. It doesn't. Every time it applies the oracle, it uses it once and throws, measures it in the Hadamard basis and throws the, the result and starts from scratch. Interestingly, um, results about depth of oracle models from, from theoretical computer science uh, uh, and lower bounds on the depth of these, uh, of, of circuits uh, have, have shown an example coming, motivated not by physics, but from, from computer science. Um, by basically taking Simon's problem and, and defining some kind of a recursive version. But uh, forget this is, not, this is not important. I just want to say that um, in order to see those exponential examples of, of separations between coherence and incoherence, you can actually look and find new results in, in computer science that also show that. And what we've shown are, are physically motivated such, such problems. Um, and such separations. And what this shows altogether is that we're basically facing a different type, a new type of exponential advantage of quantum computers in the context of quantum experiments. So not only for quantum algorithms, but also for quantum experiments, we see that quantum uh, computers will actually provide um, exponential advantages. Okay, so, um, so to wrap up, um, we are at the midst of a new era of quantum experiments and quantum measurements where, where we'll see computational ingredients, I believe, entering experiments more and more. 
um, the more we, we advance in, in our understanding of quantum computers and, in, and how to implement them in the lab. And despite the many examples I've, gave, I've given, which are uh, Gedanken experiment, the Gedanken examples, uh, we are very, very far from understanding the theoretical and experimental implications of these possibilities. And so just to put up uh, two basic questions, um, what new fancy experiments can be done using these ingredients? For example, can we use adaptiveness in a clever way to perform various experiments? And can we use complicated and tangled initial states to perform interesting quantum experiments? And the other, ex the other question that is really important, I think, is can we actually show such advantages of using quantum computers in the lab for performing experiments which are much more efficient and much more maybe precise um, in the NISC era, meaning when there is uh, noise in the system, because, because our, our coherent experiments immediately get ruined if you introduce noise in the system, because, because distinguishing between two uh, states, whether they are orthogonal or parallel, well, if you introduce noise, they immediately become orthogonal. Um, so noise completely destroys the, these protocols. Uh, at least, uh, you know, at least, uh, at least asymptotically, of course, you might be able to, to uh, demonstrate this in the lab for small systems. Um, but the question is, are there interesting examples which are robust, even without fault tolerance? So let me end here, I'll, I'll be very happy for your questions and discussions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dorit, for the very nice talk and the very nice drawing. Um, okay, so we have time for questions. So please raise your hand on Zoom. Um, so actually I have one question. Um, so for this exponential advantage between uh, coherent qualms and incoherent qualms, is this unconditional or is it based on a complexity theoretic assumption? Um, you got disconnected. I, I don't know if... Uh... Oh. Okay. Sorry, can, but can I you understand hear me? the question, I think. Ah, okay. Is this, so you're asking if this is, uh, if this depends on any uh, computational complexity assumption? Yes, yes. And uh, the answer is no, um, it's, it's oh, okay. information theoretical, mm -hmm. the lower bound. I see. Can I ask one question? Sure. Uh, so uh, in your first task uh, to distinguish a uh, fixed random oracle and uh, every time chosen oracle, so also for task, what you have shown is separation, exponential separation <clears throat> for non-coherent, no coherent case and coherent case. I'm sorry, can you, can you please repeat the question? Uh, so, so you introduced some task to distinguish a fixed random oracle and some random oracle every time you choose. And mm -hmm. so I think you didn't mention a uh, result for that task. But again, what you have shown is uh, exponential separation between coherent mm -hmm. case and non-coherent case. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Ah, okay. And yeah. So that kind of uh, separation is also possible if you use not a hard random unitary, but instead, let's say, T design unitary or something like that. Yes. Um, so I was I meant to, uh, to respond with that to Andrew as well. Um, yeah, so you can you can uh, um, use T designs, meaning uh, random unitaries, which are not completely random, but only random to if you look at them with under some a certain resolution. However, um, uh, that will limit your your polynomial to some fixed polynomial, and if you go beyond that polynomial, then you'll you'll again be able to. There, there's no guarantee you won't be able to, to distinguish between the two in polynomial time. It's just a larger polynomial. So, so that connects me to Andrew's question. Um, so for if you use T designs, let, let me say it more in a more orderly manner. We gave an example 
which which is interesting, but it's highly non-physical because of course, completely random unitaries do not exist in nature. What probably is closer to reality is something like uh, random uh, efficient quantum circuits or, or uh, T designs, for example. Um, so one would ask, are there uh, more realistic examples for, for such separations? Um, and and uh, I mean, this is part of the second question that I asked, making the whole result more realistic. And, uh, and, uh, and as, I, as I said, in, um, you can actually try to use T designs, but then you get separations which are not between polynomial and exponential, but between different types of polynomials. One can go further and ask, can you actually use computational assumptions to get stronger separations? And uh, that goes into slightly more detail than I want to say here, but the answer is that we don't know. We actually have a paragraph on that in, in the discussion in our paper. The, end, the, the bottom line is that we don't know how to do that because there is still some missing important piece in our understanding of, of, uh, of, uh, of these computational complexity assumptions on random unitaries. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Tadashi. Uh, yes, thank you very much for very interesting talk. And I'm very curious about the, uh, uh, this coherence. So could you a little bit elaborate on this coherence? Is that uh, for this quantum gates? Or I'm sorry? This and so is this uh, coherence is about for your quantum gates or this whole system? The coherence is is about is not about the quantum gates. It's the the coherence that I was talking about is uh, is about the the connection between W and L. Ah, I see. So that means kind of final measure. In your example of this uh, X-ray diffraction, that coherence is uh, some measurement by camera or? Um, the coherence is, so sorry, the, if, if W describes the camera, okay, then the interaction between the photon and the detectors in the camera need not be cohere, coherent. That's what I meant. I see. Yeah, I see. I see. Um, so, okay. So the inter the incoherence versus coherence talks mm -hmm. about the question of whether whether our our uh, la our tools in the lab uh, interact coherently with the physical system or not. Uh huh. So so this coherence is missing in this X-ray diffraction experiment. Yes. Is that true? But uh, yes. existing in other other types of you mentioned here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they are, it exists in more advanced experiments. Um, it's not that yeah, those yeah. that coherent experiments were not done, but most commonly, coherence is not used. I see. I think, so if you just uh, look. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Ah, ah, yeah, if we just talk about this X ray diffraction, so we can also have a better efficiency if you take care of this coherence measurement. Is that true? I don't know. I mean, I think it's a very interesting question if uh, one can actually perform uh, scattering experiments or, uh, or other experiments to, to deduce the structure of, of, uh, of uh, many body physical systems by using coherent um, probes and uh, and other ways. I, I don't I see. I think, yeah, that's the interesting. Yeah. Also related to multi-related high energy experiments, we usually do some collider experiment in that case. Mm -hmm. also maybe yeah, that would be very interesting to understand if cohe if we can uh, use coherence in those experiments to to enhance the precision or to, to do things that we cannot do. I see. Thank you very much. Yeah, I should say that people have been looking at also at uh, at the question of coherence over time. Forgetting about coherence in space, it's very interesting to ask how much do we do we care about coherence in time, meaning memory, coherent memory between different applications. And there is a very interesting paper which I think can be attributed to this 
by uh, Tuvia Geffen, and it's a science paper by Tuvia Geffen and Alex Wetzger and, and others about uh, deriving resolution, uh, better resolution, um, resolution and sensing using such, such types of coherence and time. Um, I haven't looked into them uh, closely, but I think, I think even just coherence and time is already uh, interesting. I see. Uh, also, in, you are, in the final part of your argument, you talked about two different measurements. One is a distinguish of time independent Hamiltonian and dependent Hamiltonian. Another one is some symmetry, kind of different symmetry Hamiltonian. So, who, so uh, do they have a different aspect? I mean, which one is much difficult or easier or such a? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the last part of the question. Ah, yeah, yeah. So I just wonder which is easier to distinguish, for example, in your complexity, like uh, estimation. Oh, uh, whether which which problem, which task is easier? The fixed yeah, yeah, unitary yeah. problem yeah, or yeah, the symmetry yeah. problem? Uh, the fixed unitary problem is very easy in the sense that uh, it's easy both theoretically, conceptually, mm -hmm. it yeah, just requires a block yeah. test. Um, it, and it's also easier in the sense of qualm complexity of how many gates it need, it requires. The symmetry distinction problem um, is more difficult conceptually. It needs to first distinguish with the unitaries from the others and then the other, then distinguish this from the other. And it requires this kind of a more sophisticated application of the swap test in which actually we have several registers in the workspace and and we use here the symplectic uh, matrix, uh, symplect the canonical symplectic form. There is, it's slightly more complicated to do. The distinction, the time reversible, uh -huh. the time reversible symmetry task. So do, do they belong to different class of this complex, if you define your complex? Oh, uh, in of, terms of quantum. Are there any quant hierarchy? Um, that's a very interesting question. Can we actually define quantum complexity classes? Um, so um, both of them require only linearly many gates and uh, and just a single, just O of one extra qubits um, beyond the qubits that are used in the lab. So um, so I think I think I would put them in the same class, but I, we have not defined classes. So this is, I if see. I were to define classes, I would say this must be in the same class. <coughs> so there are more, much more difficult uh, measurements. I believe there are. I mean, we know, for example, the only example that we know are, is really sophisticated uh, in the sense that it will require a very sophisticated application of, of, uh, of a quantum computer is this verification example. Um, as well as, sorry, the, the, the exponential measurement um, is, is uh, also will require, of course, a quantum computer to, uh, to exponentially measure, to, to derive an exponential accuracy of, uh, of, uh, of the measurement of this eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian for this particular U. This is not physically motivated, but, um, but it can also be done for commuting local Hamiltonians general commuting local Hamiltonians. And this requires much more sophisticated quantum computations. Uh -huh. um, but this has not been done. What has been done are experiments for verification. And uh, they actually use both adaptiveness. And um, so I think uh, Tomoyuki uh, mentioned in his talk, the measurement based um, protocols for verification. And they also, they require of course, quantum computation to be performed during the experiment. And they have been done, but um, I don't know of any physical system, you know, physic uh, the, the, where the motivation is physics um, is uh, motivation is is to study a physical system that is of interest to just condensed matter physics, for example, in which such uh, tricks were implemented. Oh, I see. I see. It's so interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more questions? <clears throat> Can I ask one question? 
Um, yep, please go ahead. Um, thank you for a very nice talk. So I, I'm, I'm, so my question is, uh, did you find any uh, trade-off between round complexity and I say the amount of interactions like gate complexity and the number as the number round increases, you may decrease. When you, when you say number of rounds, you mean number of calls, number of queries? Yes, yes, exactly. yes. yes, yes. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, I'm sure there is such a trade-off. We haven't, we, this is just basically a beginning. Uh, you, this I think is an excellent question. Uh, I mean, can you actually make, for example, parallelized uh, parallelize yeah. all the all the the queries and and uh, and pay by uh, by more gates, um, etc. I don't know. Um, and can you can you pay for number of rounds by more gates? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. In, in some LOCC protocols, such a trade off may appear. So I'm just wondered. Yeah, such such an interesting phenomenon appears in this setting. But yeah, thank you for. I don't know. I don't yeah. know, but this this is I think it's very interesting to study. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Um, there are no more questions. Then okay, let's thank Dorit again. Thank you very uh, much. Interesting and question. I guess we have a eight minute break until the next talk. Yeah, thank you very much, Dorit. Thanks again, Dorit. Yeah, very nice talk. Ah, hi. Hi, Tirashi. Um, okay. So uh, it's, you are now co-host, so I think you can share your slide. Yeah, let me try. Maybe could you? Yes, yeah. See my slides? Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Should I keep them shared or should I stop sharing for now? Ah, uh, you, you can keep it, yeah. Please, okay. please. Uh, so that uh, participant uh, yeah, can see. Okay. 